All right, hey team. Sa same routine as usual. We have our, uh, our handouts up front here. This week's thread, we are on week number nine, the kings, the thread of king, as we'll walk through that. Uh, same reminder as always, if you miss a week, these are online videoed along with the PDF of the handout uh, so that you can catch up. It's just gonna be me tonight. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, Daniel is uh, filling in for Garrett in the youth room. Uh, so he is, he is preaching there. So you have to suffer uh, with just me, if you can do that. All right. Anyone have any questions before we jump into it? Oh, yeah, I forgot to mention this. I, was, I wore it because I wanted to mention it during recharge. This is our men's, uh, our men's retreat t-shirt for the weekend. So um, hope to see you. Uh, if you are not signed up and you want to come last minute, I bet that guy right there can make it happen. He's a magician. He can make it happen. Now, we really look forward to our men's retreat weekend and... Uh, Hope that you are signed up. And for real, probably ask him. Maybe he'll tell you no, but he might tell you yes if you can make it this weekend. We're going uh, just, just outside of Austin. We're going just west of Austin. Yeah, I'm talking about you, so quit looking around. Um, so for, for a great weekend. Uh, Daniel and I are, are leading that. So we good? Any other questions? All right, G give me some quick feedback on the, on the threads. Uh, what, what have been some of the weeks that have been most exciting for you? Some of the pieces that, that we've put together that you start, maybe you didn't think of that before and suddenly you're like, oh my goodness. Yeah, look at that. Anyone? Okay, the temple. The idea of the temple, great. Beginning in Eden and the tabernacle, the temple, and then Jesus as the temple, and then us as the temple, and then the ultimate end of the new heaven and new earth as a temple. It's good. Any others? This would be the chance for you to participate. The prophets, right? Wasn't that fun? The pairings of the prophets. So there's lots that you can do with prophets. We had to condense that down to where it would be uh, kind of streamlined for an evening like this. But those, those pairings of prophets, have you ever noticed it before that, that Moses and Joshua and Elijah, Elijah and Elisha and then uh, John the Baptist and Jesus and that you have those pairings and there's all those parallels that go with that. Yeah. Awesome. Anything else you guys have enjoyed? Maybe I rock you to sleep every time like Danny. Danny falls asleep half the time here, so. All right. Well, then we'll jump into it, okay? Uh, let's pray, then we'll get started. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this evening and a chance to, uh, to study your word and to think well and write about it. Um, to see, God, that you are the author of history and all of your word. And, and even though it's been written over thousands of years with so many different authors, your Holy Spirit was planning and uh, in a beautiful, magnificent way, slowly unfolding the drama of the revelation of your son so that when he came and when we see it, we would know undoubtedly that he is your son and that we should place all of our faith and hope in him. And so it is in the strong name of Jesus that we pray, amen. All right, so uh, tonight you have tons of information that I wrote out, but as usual, I, I want you, we're gonna go through it fast. Uh, I want you to cognitively 
pay attention and just understand the overall movement. Um, and you can go back later and, and study much of this, okay? So we're gonna begin the story of the king, okay? The king as it's woven through scripture. We begin with Adam, who's going to be our fallen king, okay? Now, Adam is specifically made and endowed by God himself and is specifically called the son of God. We'll see that thread of the son of God and the importance of it. You may say, well, Adam is never specifically called a king. Well, because at that point, there's no one else on earth, so there's no one for him to rule over. But he is given the form and function of a king. Look at those four things right there in the middle. He is given dominion. He is supposed to reign over creation. He's made in God's image and likeness, okay? He's in, uh, implicitly God's son. He's given authority over creation. He's called to name creation, which is a shepherding function. We're gonna spend a whole week on shepherd. Um, and he is called to serve and to protect Eden, the garden, right, and his wife. And so all of those are kingly functions. Now, we know that Adam falls short of his kingly duties, okay? So there's the fall of the king. Now, as you fast forward in the story, God is going to choose for himself a people that he calls his own. This is part of his unfolding plan of redemption. Now, interestingly enough, what we're gonna see here in a moment is that God is going to be king over his people. God wants to be king and king alone. And yet, even though we, we're, we're gonna see that here, and yet you will also notice that early on in God's formation of his people, there are promises of a king, okay? So after we get to the end, this will make a little more sense, but you will be able to look back at Genesis 49. We know this one pretty often in scripture, right? Because as Jacob is is praying his blessings over his son, who gets the kingly line? Judah, right? The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet until Shiloh comes. Now that word Shiloh means the one to whom it belongs. Okay, the scepter shall not depart from Judah until the one to whom it belongs comes. Okay, so you're, you're gonna see that. There's another uh, incredible section um, that's gonna be forward-looking. How many of you guys remember the story of Balaam and his donkey? Okay, Balaam was hired by King Elimelech to come and to curse the people of God. Okay, and Balaam's a, a prophet. He's not, uh, he's not even a, a good prophet because he's a prophet by hire who's called to come and curse the people of God. But he gets there and he goes to curse them and what comes out is blessing. And in the midst of that blessing, listen to what he says in Numbers uh, 24. He says, I see him, but not now. I behold him, but not near. A star shall come forth from Jacob. A scepter shall rise from Israel and shall crush through the forehead of Moab. Uh, of Moab. When, when you hear shall crush through the forehead of Moab, what image does that strike for you? Louder, I can't. Not, yeah, yes, what biblical image do you, huh? Goliath. Okay, Goliath, but go back to Genesis 3. What's the promise to the serpent? The serpent will do what to the seed of the woman? Bite on the heel. And what is the woman's seed gonna do to the serpent? Crush his head, okay? So you see that right here, okay? If anyone's gonna crush through the forehead of Moab, you're like, oh, that, that should make us think of that seed of the woman, okay? And then you can see here, one from Jacob will have dominion. Okay, so what I'm showing is that, is that you, you can look back early on and you can see that, that there are unfolding promises of a coming king. Now, skip over Moses as king. I'll refer back to that in a second. But Adam fell as the original king. He's fallen. And so God has restored to himself a people. 
Make no mistake about it, God wants to be king over Israel, okay? Here's a couple passages where that is specifically stated, right? And, and they're looking back at who brought them out of the Exodus? Well, it was God, it was Yahweh who did, and he is their king, all right? So Yahweh wants to be the king of the people, but even early on, Moses predicted, hey, as you guys go into the land, this is Deuteronomy 17, you're gonna ask for a king. You're gonna ask for a king. You're gonna say, we want to be like the other nations. Now, when it actually happens in 1 Samuel chapter 8, verse 7, look at the verbiage here. Because God takes it as a rejection of his own kingship, okay? The Lord said to Samuel, listen to the voice of the people. Samuel was, was hurt because he said, they have rejected me. And God said, look, they haven't rejected you, okay? For they have not rejected you, but they have rejected me from being king over them. And you can see it's repeated there again in uh, 1 Samuel chapter 12. Now, let's pause and think about this for a second. Why is it that Israel wants a king? Everyone else has one, all right? So they want to be like the nations. They're gonna state that specifically. But also, as you press and you work through it, there's this important factor. They wanted someone that they could see. They wanted a singular representative that they could see. Do you remember when Moses went up on Mount Sinai? They liked Moses, who led them out, and then he went up on Mount Sinai, and what happened? Well, after 40 days of him not returning, what did the people do? Yeah, they ask for a new God. They know, uh, they, they call him, they call the golden calf Yahweh, okay? They're trying to make something that they can see. They say, well, I don't know what happened to Moses. I don't know where that guy went, but we need someone that we can see. And so they form this golden calf and they say, there's your God who led you out of Egypt. Now we look at that and we think that's absolutely ridiculous because you just made it. How could that have been the God that led you out? They want some, someone to see, okay? They want this singular representative that they could see that goes before them, all right? So they say, we, we want to be just like all the other nations. We want a king that will go out, okay, and may judge us and go out before us and fight our battles. So God allows them to have a king. Now, we know where this is ultimately going, okay? Saul is the first king of Israel. Now, what do you remember about King Saul? Okay, Saul is picked for all the superficial reasons that you would pick a king. I have none of those attributes. He was, he was tall, he was handsome, he was rich, he was well-known. You, you can see that right there, okay? He's a man of wealth, he's a choice and handsome man, and he was taller than any of the other people, all right? So King Saul is picked for all the superficial reasons. Now that said, it's quickly followed by Saul's disobedience. Do you guys remember in, in which ways was Saul disobedient? Yeah, there, there, were, there were two major instances. The first is uh, before they went into battle, um, a priest would offer a sacrifice, God's blessing to help them on the battle. And Samuel wasn't there, and Samuel was the priest. And Saul was there, and he's ready for battle, and his guys are ready for battle, but he must wait for Samuel to show up. And Saul sees his guys in disarray, and he doesn't feel like he can wait any longer, and he offers an illegal sacrifice, because at this time, the kingship and the priesthood are separated. Okay, we're gonna see that thread reunited with kings, with, with the Melchizedek, who's the priest king, but right now, very strictly separated. King, kingship and priesthood. Well, Saul offered the sacrifice, okay? 
Look at the passage that immediately follows. Samuel, so then Samuel shows up on the horizon, comes up and says, you have acted foolishly. You have not kept the commandment of the Lord your God, which he commanded you, all right? For now the Lord would have established your kingdom over Israel forever. Oh my goodness. What does that mean? That the promises that we're about to see in David would have come to Saul. But now your kingdom shall not endure. But the Lord has sought out for himself a man after his own heart. And the Lord has appointed him as ruler over his people. Okay? So we are going to see the kingdom ripped from Saul and given to another This forever kingdom, this promise that we're going to see unfolding is given to another. Now check this out because you may be wondering, why is it, did you know who picked Saul as king? Anyone know? God did. Did you know that? They did it by casting lots, but God did it. God's the one who picked the superficial king. And then he was disobedient and he kicked him out. Why? Well, there is this pattern. We've been looking at patterns, right? That's what we're doing. There is this pattern of the second. We talked about this uh, a little before. Think about it like this. Moses died when entering the promised land. He led them out of Egypt, but Moses died and Joshua, the second one, Yeshua, is the one who led God's people into the promised land. The second one did. The first failed, the second entered. This pattern actually began with Terran, Abraham's father, who died en route to the promised land. If you go back and read Genesis 11, beginning in verse 31, do you know who was actually in the land of Ur and got, got up and began to lead his family out of Ur? It was Terran. It wasn't Abraham. It, it literally says, Terran got up and began to lead his family to the land of Canaan. But they got to Haran halfway and he died. And then Abraham got up and finished and led them into the land. So I want to show you, look at this real briefly, this pattern of the promise going to the second. Terran and Abraham, Moses and Joshua Ishmael and Isaac, Esau and Jacob, and Saul and David. Now Galatians 4, if you go back and read this, Galatians 4, 21 through 31, you will actually see an extended argument that Paul makes about this pattern and the, the, the way that the first covenant, the Mosaic covenant, was doomed to fail because it needed to be replaced by the second, the greater covenant. That that which brought about death was to be replaced by the second one, the one that brings about life. He likens it to slavery and the son of the promise. He does it with Ishmael and Isaac, okay? But it is this pattern here, okay? Now, with that said, you can shake all the cobwebs out because we're about to enter into uh, the most important section uh, in understanding the kings, and we're going to look through two very important passages revolving around David. Because, all right, so the the kingdom is taken from Saul and given to David, the second one. All right, there's a couple, there's two very important passages that I need to, to weave together so that you can understand them. And in fact, these passages that I'm about to quote are gonna become the most uh, Uh, The most repeated passages in the whole of the Bible, they unfold repeatedly in the New Testament so that you would understand what God is doing, okay? First, let me trace for you the line of the Son of God. We've done this a couple times. It was back several weeks ago um, when we did Adam, okay? But this title, Son of God is first given to Adam, okay? Um, And in some sense or fashion, all of us, because we're made in the image of God, we we might take on that title uh, also as being descendants of Adam. But then God creates, uh, uh, I can't write and talk at the same time. Uh, 
God calls his own people unto himself. And we've walked through, and you can see the verses there, where God begins to call his own people, Israel, his firstborn and his son. It becomes a repeated theme. Okay, so you have Adam, and then you have the special chosen ones of Israel, and then you have here to David, this kingship, you have this title used again where it is given to the son of David. Those are the two passages that I'm about to show you where sonship is applied to King David in these promises. Uh, but what you need to understand, we first must understand these passages in their original context. But what I wanna show you with this growing pattern here is that Israel, uh, so all that are in Adam are in one sense the son of God, but then Israel's the special chosen section called out as son of God, but then the king over Israel holds this special, unique, special, special purpose as that selective son of God. That's how the elevation of this title works, okay? Here's where the promises come. First, let's begin in 2 Samuel chapter 7. Okay, real quickly, the context here is, you remember David, after he's moved the, uh, uh, his capital to Jerusalem, he's settled in the land, he has peace from all of his enemies, and he's kind of sitting down, and he, he makes this statement, I have such a nice house of cedar, and God's in this tent. He's, he's moved the tabernacle, and he says, I want to build God a house, Okay. It's to that, he tells Nathan, Nathan says, that's a great idea. Um, and then Nathan leaves, and that night, the Lord comes and speaks to Nathan and says, no, 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 you go back and you tell David something, okay? This is the promise that comes back from Nathan, okay? The Lord has declared to you, okay, that the Lord will make a house for you. David, you wanted to build God a house? No, 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 no. God's going to build a house for you. Now, that's a play there on the term house that's going to talk about dynasty or descendants, okay? Well, let's read this. When your days are complete and you lie down with your fathers, I will raise up your descendant after you who will come forth from you and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be a father to him, and he will be a son to me. There's that language. He will be a son to me. That's this key sonship. Very special. Okay? Where did I go? Now catch this in verse 14. Now, when he commits iniquity, I will correct him with the rod of men and with the strokes of the sons of men. But my loving kindness shall not depart from him as I took it away from Saul, whom I removed from before you. Your house and your kingdom shall endure before me forever. Your throne shall be established forever. All right, now, when you read that passage in Old Testament context, you have to put it in its Old Testament context and understand it first. And the first way that you should read that passage and understand it is that it's pertaining to King Solomon, okay? King Solomon is going to build God a house. What's that called? The temple, okay? And the other reason that you must immediately think of Solomon is because it says, when he commits iniquity, okay? In other words, Christian, you can't immediately jump to Jesus because if this is all about Jesus, we've got major problems in our theology, don't we? Because if Jesus committed any iniquity, the whole thing falls apart, okay? So, you are to understand this as Solomon, David, you are going to have a son, and he's going to have son. You're going to have descendant, okay, that's going to come after you, and I, he's going to be called my son. He's going to be a special son to me. He's going to build for me a house, 
okay? But then woven in there, what you must also notice is what are all these forever kingdom promises? See that in verse 13 and verse 16? Both of which talk about a forever kingdom. All right. Let's read Psalm 2. Okay, Psalm 2, flip the page. Also written by King David, okay? Well, I say also. First Samuel, or Second Samuel was not. All right, Psalm 2 is written by David. And by the way, uh, Psalms 1 and 2 act as an introduction to the entire book of Psalms, okay? So Psalm 1 is all about the word of the Lord. Base your life on it. Psalm 2 is all about the king, okay? Those two act as an introduction to the entire psalm. Why are the nations in an uproar and the peoples devising a vain thing? The kings of the earth, they take their stand and the rulers take their, their counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed. Okay, pause right there. That word anointed, look over to the side. In Hebrew, it's the word uh, Messiah. In Greek, it's the word Christ. It means the anointed one. Do you remember when David wouldn't kill King Saul? What's the reason he gave? Well, he's anointed. I can't kill him. God's got to take care of him. I'm not going to kill him. He's the Lord's anointed. Okay, it's a title for the king. Very important. Okay, so why are the nations rising up and taking their stand against the Lord and his anointed? Okay, uh, God scoffs at them. He scoffs from heaven. Uh, let us tear their feathers apart and cast away his, his cords from us. He who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord scoffs at them. He will speak to them in his anger and terrify them in his fury, saying, but as for me, I have installed my king upon Zion, my holy mountain. You kind of think of this trajectory, right? God, is, God has picked his he has his nation and his king, and he knows what he's doing, so the nations can be against him in an uproar, but God has his. And surely I will tell of the decree of the Lord. He said to me, you are my son, and today I have begotten you. There's that son language. You are my son. Why? Because you are the king over Israel. You are my son. Today I have begotten you. Okay? It's, it's that now that this day has come, now that you've been coronated, now that you have been crowned, now you are king and you are the son of God. So ask of me and I will surely give the nations as your inheritance and the very ends of the earth as your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron and you shall shatter them like earthenware. Skip down to the end, kiss the son that he may not become angry and you perish in the way, for his wrath may soon be kindled. How blessed are those who take refuge in him. All right, so if you put those two passages together, okay, you would say, well, the Davidic king has a special, unique role. Under God's kingship, he has become a royal son, right? Today I have begotten you. But you also must notice, again, the promises, they escalate. They are ever increasing. The nations as your inheritance to the very ends of the earth and all must bow down and kiss the sun. Now, given these promises, understanding them in an original context, how would you imagine that David or the rest of Israel interpreted these promises. Well, the pretty natural thinking is that we have a kingdom, we have a king, and we are going to have an endless succession of Davidic kings, right? And our kingdom cannot be destroyed because we will always have Davidites on the throne because God has given his promise. He will not turn away from him the way that he did to Saul. All right, with that set, okay, 
okay, we're, we're, gonna, we're gonna see the way that these promises unfold. But with that said, David and Solomon, as you understand your Old Testament, they constitute what we call the golden years, the golden reign. But even as you go through that, you realize for as great as this period is, there's always something wrong, right? So I've given you a couple passages here where you can see that David had peace and prosperity and the Lord gave him rest from all of his enemies. And you can read chapters stacked together of David's triumph, but then what happens? This overt, gross sin with Bathsheba and murdering Uriah. And then God unleashes a curse upon his family, upon his descendants. And then Solomon comes and he takes the throne. And he is said to receive the peace of his father David and he has prosperity. And you can read about, look, look at verse, uh, 1 Kings eight fifty six. right? Blessed be the Lord has given rest to his people Israel according to all that he promised. Not one word has failed from all of his good promises which he promised through Moses the servant, right? So th this is like the, you know, the blessings and the curses section of like Leviticus 26, like when you get in the land. And here's this, this section, this short, little period where you see, oh man, they've, they've achieved it. They've got a peace and they've got prosperity and this is great. But simultaneously woven in there, you know what you find out even with Solomon? He's deceived by wealth and women. He was actually specifically told not to multiply horses and wives. This is Moses' command way back in Deuteronomy 17. He says, look, when you enter the land and when you ask for the king, even though I don't want you to have a king, but when you ask for a king and when he comes, he shall not multiply horses for himself. He shall not multiply wives, nor shall he greatly increase silver and gold for himself. Uh-oh. Because I've given you just a couple passages. I mean, the most ridiculous passage maybe in the whole of Scripture is that Solomon had 700 wives and princesses and 300 concubines. I can't think of anything more absurd in my entire life. One wife is more than enough for me. This guy had a 1,000. So you already notice, hey, even though there's the promise is unfolding, there are kinks in the armor, even in the golden years. And what happens immediately after Solomon? Everything falls apart. Rehoboam's the king, the kingdom splits, and then you have an endless succession in the northern kingdom of nothing but bad kings. They don't have even one good king. And in David's line in Judah, and just the Judah and Benjamin, the only two that of what's going to be called Judah, you just have this alternating good king, bad king, bad king, bad king, good king, good king, bad king, bad king, bad king, until it just gets worse and worse and worse, and they go off into exile. Now, as that unfolds, you know what rises up? The prophets begin to speak more and more clear about this coming king, okay? The prophets begin to unfold. Hey, you, you saw David, and he, he looked kind of good, but there were some kinks that you obviously saw, and you saw Solomon, and you saw some of his flaws, and then as the kings get worse, <coughs> you start to hear the prophets come stronger and stronger and stronger with, listen, there's coming one who is a king. And so look at these. Look at some of these. We, we read a lot of this in, at Christmas time, right? Isaiah 9. By the way, I, Isaiah 9 is 700 years before Jesus, and it's 200 years before the exile, okay? So it's just in a string of bad kings, and suddenly Isaiah, by the way, we looked at Isaiah a lot a couple weeks ago when we talked about the exodus, because Isaiah has this theme. There is a new exodus coming, because you're going to go off into exile, and we're going to come back, and then here. For a child will be born to us, a son will be given, and the government will rest upon his shoulders. And his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, 
mighty God, eternal Father, Prince of Peace. And there will be no end to the increase of his government or of peace. And on the throne of David and over his kingdom. Oh, wait a second. That's a pretty bold and grandiose promise. While we look up to the throne and we realize we got a bunch of rotten kings around here. Oh, but there's coming one. Okay? And see it again later. Then a shoot will spring from the stem of Jesse. Now, Jesse is who? David's father. So this is a poetic way of saying, hey, this is the Davidic line. Okay? And a branch from the roots will bear. And then you go through Isaiah 11 and you can see it's talking about a spirit-filled leader and it specifically mentions the root of Jesse. And then the prophet Ezekiel. It's an incredible passage. You can, you can look up here real quick. So the prophet Ezekiel. Uh, the first 33 chapters of Ezekiel is, by, by the way, Ezekiel has been exiled. Okay, so he's in the, the second wave of the exile. There are three waves of exile. Okay, so Babylon has already come in and conquered Israel, but Jerusalem hasn't fallen. The temple hasn't fallen. And Ezekiel's carried off into exile, and he spends the first 33 chapters saying, guys, guess what? Israel's gonna fall. Jerusalem's gonna fall. The temple's going to be destroyed, Okay? And then in, in chapter 33, it finally happens, okay? So when you read Ezekiel, first 33 chapters are nothing but judgment. You're like, judgment is coming, judgment is coming, judgment is coming, okay? And you're like, give us a different song. But there's not a different song. It's judgment is coming. But then once the temple falls, immediately you get hope. They didn't think the temple could fall. Why didn't they think the temple could fall? Well, it's God's house. How could, like, it doesn't matter how bad we are. God's house can't fall. We well, you know what happened at the very beginning of Ezekiel. The Shekinah glory of the Lord left the temple. That was the first vision that Ezekiel had. He's like, he's gone. It's going to fall, okay? And, and it's all tied to these Davidic promises, right? They're like, look, God gave promises to David and to the temple. There's no way this thing's fallen. As bad as we get, it's not fallen. It falls, Immediately after it falls, Ezekiel 34, one of the awesome passages in the whole of Scripture, God is lamenting the leaders that have been in Israel, and he calls them my shepherds. He says, you know what all these shepherds are doing? They're eating the sheep. They don't care about the sheep at all. They're not leading my sheep. They're eating the sheep. They only care about themselves. They're sacrificing the sheep for themselves. And then he goes into this incredible rant, this incredible like sermon that's poetic and powerful. And God starts to say, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to come down there and I'm going to feed my sheep and I'm going to nurse them back to hell and I'm going to find the ones that have wandered away and I'm going to shepherd them and I'm going to gather them and I'm going to and I'm going to and I'm going to and I'm like 21 times in this entire section she says I will, I will, I will and then this section ends with and I'm going to send my servant David. God's coming, God's coming, God's coming. I'm going to send my servant David. An incredible passage. Then I will set over them one shepherd, my servant David, and he will feed them, and, uh, and he will feed them himself, and he will be their shepherd. And I, the Lord, will be their God, and my servant David will be their prince. And, he, and you know that, that initial language where God was the king, and, and then the, the, the king was supposed to, to be the prince underneath that. He says, I'm gonna send my servant David and we're gonna restore that. I'm gonna be king, he's gonna be my prince. And so as this unfolds, you begin to see the prophets begin to be clearer and clearer as the kings are terrible, the line of kings are terrible, that there is coming a king. Okay, Psalm 89. Psalm 89 is really, really important to understand, one, the book of Psalms, and to the Old Testament and this movement for kings. We've looked at the promises given to David. Psalm 89 is written 
during the exile. Okay, so similar to, to what we just talked about in Ezekiel, okay? So uh, it's written during the exile, and remember, no one thought Jerusalem could fall. Well, you know what else happened uh, during the exile? That is, all the Davidic line of kings were killed. In fact, the last Davidic king was taken and, and uh, carried off the throne, okay? Uh, he's captured. He has to watch his son slaughtered in front of him, and then his eyes are gouged out. So the very last thing that he saw was his sons being slaughtered. And then he's held in captivity until he dies, okay? Very gory, graphic, fun stories of the Bible. Read that to your children tonight. Okay, so the Davidic king is gone, and they're in exile, and uh, Jerusalem has fallen. So Psalm 89 is written during that time, and this is what the psalm sounds like. It begins with, God, you are on your throne, and God, you have given promises to your servant David. And then it spends a whole first chunk, and it waxes eloquent about the trustworthiness and the faithfulness of God. God is on his throne. He is always on his throne. He's always in control. Then it gets to the section. All right, God, you're on your throne. And you gave promises to King David. And then he starts quoting uh, 2 Samuel chapter 7 and Psalm 2. Right? We, we just covered those. Remember that son of God language? Remember that uh, if he sins, uh, you're going to discipline him, but you're not going to forsake him? Okay? The psalmist co goes through, combs through the very same passages I've read to you and quotes them back to God. God, you are on your throne. You're in control. By the way, you gave these promises to David, and here they are. And then he says, where are you? Nothing looks like what it's supposed to look like. All of David's descendants are dead. I don't possibly see how these promises are true, how they're being worked out. It doesn't make any sense. And then the psalm just ends. It just ends with a lament. It says, we have no David on the throne. It looks like you've forsaken. How can the promises be true? Return back to your loving kindness because your enemies have approached your anointed one. And that's how Psalm 89 ends. Now, the book of Psalms is a little more complex. That's its own different study. So you're gonna have to trust me on this for tonight that uh, Psalm 110 is the answer to Psalm 89. By the way, let's go back and let's re-ask this question. Remember people's expectation. The promises of, of a forever kingdom given to David, what did they expect? An endless succession of kings, right? That's obviously not happened. So what else could it be? Psalm 110 is the psalm's answer to Psalm 89, to this question. Ready? A psalm of David. The Lord, Yahweh, says to my Lord, Adonai. Jesus will argue extensively in the New Testament. How is it that David who is the king and the originator of the... How is it that he calls one of his descendants Lord? The Lord, Yahweh, says to my Adonai, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. 
And the Lord will stretch forth your strong scepter from Zion, saying, rule in the midst of your enemies. Your people will volunteer freely in the day of your power and in holy array from the womb of the dawn. Your youth are to you as the dew. The Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. We walk through that. That's the combination of the priest and kingly line. In other words, there is coming one. There is one, there is this Lord who is coming and he's gonna join the king and priestly line. The only way that there could be a forever kingdom coming from the descendants of David, if you don't have an endless succession of kings, is that there is coming one who is forever himself. And his kingdom is completely different than anything you've ever thought of or imagined. Then you can look at this incredible passage out of Daniel chapter seven, where Daniel looks and sees one like the son of man coming up to the ancient of days. And the ancient of days presents to him and to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom and all the peoples and nations. Every tribe and language might serve him and his dominion is an everlasting dominion which will not pass away and his kingdom is one which will not be destroyed. So what you see is this unfolding story of this longing for a king that we can see. God says, all right, I'll give you a king and the first one's terrible. The next one is one after his own heart, but even that one falls way, way short. And then you begin to see unfolding promises, okay, of, well, there's got to be a coming one. There has to be one that is going to be and fulfill this forever kingdom and these forever promises. And that is exactly what the New Testament teaches and tries to scream at you over and over and over again about King Jesus, okay? We will focus the rest of our time in rapid fashion on really the end of Jesus' life. You can look at the very beginning at the introduction of Jesus and the way that he is presented in his titles, okay? Luke and Matthew uh, point to the genealogy. They want you to know that Jesus is the son of David, Okay, you need to see the way uh, this, the titles, Son of God and King of Israel, are used in tandem, both in John 1.49, and you remember Peter's confession, right, at Philippi, but who do you say that I am? Well, you are the Christ. That's that word anointed, Messiah. Okay, you are the Christ. That's a kingly title. The Son of the living God, okay? Okay. Now, here's the, here's the fun part, okay? That is the entire passion narrative, I mean, is screaming at you that this is the long-awaited king, okay? The triumphal entry. There are a few details that are woven in there that you and I don't naturally pick up on unless we're really good Old Testament readers, So did you know that when King David picked Solomon to be his heir, do you know how he showed that to all of Jerusalem? Solomon got on David's donkey and rode around Jerusalem, okay? It it would be later kings that ride a horse, okay? Not David. David rode a donkey, and put Solomon on him and said, this is my king, this is my son, my heir, and he rode him around Jerusalem. You can read about that in 1 Kings chapter 133. Did you also know that in ancient Near East culture, in coronation for a king, they would take off their garment and place it underneath on the path as the king is, and and you can see this here in 2 Kings 9, when King Jehu, they're taking off their garments and laying them in front. Well, guess what? Those are the exact things, same things that happen as Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem. Two things that you and I don't naturally pick up on, 
but are woven in scripture as the triumphal entry, and there's the presentation of the king. And just in case you miss it, Zechariah 9, 9 is really straightforward. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout in triumph, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. He is just and endowed with salvation, humble and mounted on a donkey, even a colt, the foal of a donkey. Which, by the way, Matthew quotes, just in case you don't miss it. Why? Because the king is being presented. On his way in, the crowd shouts and quotes Psalm 118. And in the Gospel of Luke, he inserts, so I guess the crowd did, instead of blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, in the Gospel of Luke, It says, blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Furthermore, Jesus' trial, you've heard me say this before, so it's not gonna be that revolutionary, but most people don't really piece together why was Jesus killed? Jesus was killed flat out for being the king, for claiming to be the king, And that's the entire art. They could not get any charge to stick. And so the the high priest says, well, tell us plainly, are you the Christ, the son of God? Okay, what does he reply? He says, you have said it yourself. Nevertheless, I tell you, hereafter you will see the son of man sitting at the right hand of power and coming on the clouds of heaven. Now, I just read for you Daniel chapter seven. That's what he's quoting, okay? Do you see how we're piecing the same scripture passages together? All of this in the kingly thread. That's exactly what Jesus says to them. You've said it, that I am the Christ, the Son of God, and I will come riding on the clouds, okay? And they tear their robes, they blaspheme, and they say he deserves death. Why? What are the charges, okay? Then he goes before Pilate. What's the question? Are you the king of the Jews? The crowd, the the high priest, get Pilate to take the case because they said he is claiming to be the king. But Caesar's king. This is an insurrection. This is a this is a rising up. He says he's king. We've heard it out of his own mouth. And so that's what the charges are. So what did they do? They mock him as king. They throw a purple robe and a crown of thorns and put a reed in his hand and mock him and say, hail, king of the Jews. And then here it is, above his head, they put the charge against him. What are the charges? This is Jesus, king of the Jews. All the mocking. He said he was king. Well, why doesn't he come down? If he trusts God, let God rescue him. If he delights in him, for he said, I am the son of God. You see, the entire thing is the presentation, the trial, and the death of the king. But the king rises from the dead. It's what we've walked through. Why didn't you come down? Well, because I was accomplishing eternal things, eternal kingdom, eternal life. I was doing all those things. And when Jesus comes back, he gives us his final commission as king. Why? Because all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Therefore, you better listen to what he says. And then the New Testament unfolds the ascension of the risen king. Where does Jesus go? Where is Jesus right now? He's at the right hand of God the Father because at the ascension, he goes and he sits at the right hand of the Father. And this is the imagery that gets unfolded throughout the entire rest of the Bible, that he is sitting on the throne, that before him, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father, that God is working Jesus' kingdom. Jesus' kingdom will go to the ends of the earth that all will know that there is one king who rules and who reigns. I mean, the rest of the New Testament is the unfolding of the king and where he sits and how he rules and reigns. 
And you get picture after picture after picture of the ruling, magnificent king. And one day, he will come back. And he will not come back riding on a donkey. Instead, he will come back riding on a white horse, conquering. And time will be no more. And, and that will be it. It is final. And everyone, did you know that both judge, that, that the judgment seat is before King Jesus himself? That all the damned have to come before King Jesus. And even you and I will go before King Jesus and the books will be open and our rewards will be doled out in front of King Jesus. Why? Because he is the King of kings and he is the Lord of lords. It's the entire movement of the whole of scripture. There's another super cool thread that I'll tease you with. So I'm really, really, really excited about next week. Okay, next week is my most favorite thing because it's on uh, the righteous sufferer. But there's this really cool thread um, where, and it involves the kings, that's why I'm telling you now. There's, there's three times in scripture that I know off off the top of my head where the king wants to give all authority to the number two who sits at his right hand, okay? We're, we're gonna cover it next week underneath the righteous sufferer. But one of those instances is Pharaoh and Joseph. Remember all the end of Genesis? You have Pharaoh and as you comb through that story, the interesting thing about it is we actually know very little about Pharaoh. We know that he's king, but we also know that Pharaoh really loves the number two, the hero of the story that rises up. And Pharaoh wants to put everything, all rule and authority at the number two's feet. You better listen to the number two because he has complete jurisdiction over the land, okay? And then that pattern gets repeated with Esther and Mordecai. And when that whole thing ends, you have a similar pronouncement where uh, uh, the king, I can't remember his name off the top of my head, sorry, uh, turns to Mordecai and gives him the number two position over the kingdom. Again, the hero of the story rises up and, and gets to that number two position. And there's one more spot, and it's my favorite typology in the whole of Scripture, and we're going to go to it next week extensively, so this is going to be your homework. I want you to read Daniel chapter 6, because in Daniel chapter 6, it's another typology like this that happens where King, King Darius, has these leaders, and there's one that rises up amongst them, Daniel, and by the end of that story, the king wants to give all all dominion and authority and praise and recognition to Daniel, right? Everyone needs to know Daniel's a super awesome number two. He's the guy, okay? And what's fascinating about that pattern is that's also the pattern for all of eternity. This movement where God says to his son, sit at my right hand, until I make your enemies a footstool. I'm gonna fight for you and I'm gonna make sure everyone comes and bows down before you. The whole world must know about you. You see, woven in these patterns and these stories are patterns that are pointing towards this coming number two, the hero. The king that we have longed for because he's a king that we can see and we can touch and we can feel and we can know and we're going to know him all into eternity. And he's what our soul longs for. He is the king that we have wanted. And it says at the end of time, everything will be placed before King Jesus. And then King Jesus will turn it all back over to the Father and eternity will begin. All right, that's most of our time. I, I probably got time for a five minutes worth of questions. Yes, ma'am. Do we know when the Ark of the Covenant left the temple? 
Yeah, great question. Uh, I don't, off the top of my head, if you couldn't hear, the question was, when did the Ark of the Covenant leave the temple? Um, what you see in the book of, in the book of Ezekiel is uh, that crazy contraption that's at the beginning of Ezekiel chapter one. It's very much like the Ark of the Covenant, except it's, it's mobile, okay? It's on, it's on those wheels that go every which way. Um, and, and that's supposed to signify to you, that's, that's God's mobile throne. Um, so I know that. I do not know the specifics of when the Ark of the Covenant actually left um, and, and what happened. Uh, I mean, I know Jerusalem was, was burned by, by Babylon, and I, I don't know if they pulled the Ark out or not. Indiana Jones probably knows, though. Yeah. <laughs> Any other questions about the kings? Does this make sense? These unfolding promises, right? You, you have to see them in their original context, but then you have to see how, how there's all this confusion, expectation. Why isn't it that there isn't a, a, a David on the throne? Because there's a coming one. And it's even why in the New Testament, right, they, they imagined that Jesus was just going to take back over, throw over the Romans, give them their nation back, and, and go right back to being just the David on the throne. They, they did not know or expect that, that he was going to rule and reign from heaven and that his kingdom is a different kingdom. Okay? I, uh, if I read my Bible now, I kind of see it a little bit different looking for things. Yeah. I just um, finished Genesis going into um, Exodus and the story of Joseph and how they're there, they're multiplying, they're doing what God said to do, multiplying. And so Pharaoh notices that Yeah, yeah, that's good. Just kind of reading things like that. Yeah, and that's, that's the whole purpose of this, right? Me tracing these themes is, is so that you can understand largely your Old Testament and, and see the way that the New Testament is, is screaming the fulfillment of all of these things, right? And for you to understand, right, that woven throughout history, promises of God and people that held on to the promises of God, but they didn't quite know how they were going to work out, right? And, and even Psalm 89, Psalm 89 is one of my favorite, right? Because you read it and the psalmist is confused, right? He's like, God, I understand your promises. I just don't see how what's happening here is gonna work out, right? I don't see how your promises could possibly be true if you're looking at what I'm looking at, right? But we, what we can look back and what do we say, right? What, how would you speak to that psalmist? You would say, hold on. The promises are greater than what you could ever imagine. He's not just talking about fixing the king or your nation. He's talking about bringing an eternal kingdom, overcoming death, ruling from heaven. There's coming an eternal king. It's greater than what you could ever imagine. Hold on. So it should give us such a confidence, such a hope that God's unfolding plans. And don't you love the, uh, the drama of God, the, 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 way, the poetic nature in which he writes with, this, with, with his, like he doesn't come out and then scene one, all right, here's what's gonna happen, right? No, 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 God, God's dramatic. He, he writes like a mystery novel, if you will, right? It's, it's been unfolding in bits and pieces throughout history. That's the way God reveals himself to us, Okay? But once you finally see the real deal and then you look back, you're suddenly able to go, he's everywhere. He's in the prophets. He's in the kings. He's in the temple. He's in the on and on and on. He's the new exodus. He's everything. And, and it gives you so much confidence and assurance. My goodness, this God has been authoring 
all of this stuff, and all of it points to one direction, and it's all through King Jesus, and it's all for our salvation, and it gives us our story as we move forward so we can have confidence and assurance, right, that he is true, that he has saved me, and that he's gonna keep his promises all the way until the end. And so it, when you can look back and you can see other people confused and go, but God's promises were so much greater than what you could ever imagine, then it gives you confidence moving forward. It goes, you know what? I may not have it all together, but I know who does. Amen? All right, let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word, for your goodness and your kindness to us and allowing us to see, God, that we sit this side of the cross in your word and we can see your fulfillment in all that you have done so that we might know you, God. Give us faith. Help us to walk faithful. Encourage and in your spirit, we love you in Jesus' name, amen.